a lot of people do fear public speaking. Why do you think that is? There is a hierarchy of human needs, right? I think it's Maslow who uh, has established that as the cornerstone for anthropology, sociology, and it actually ranks fourth, but it's not expressed as public speaking. It's expressed as fear of rejection, of not mm. fitting in, of embarrassment, of being perceived as less than. The number one fear is being eaten by a tiger. It's fear of being extinguished by something. And, and that's obviously primal. And then it goes down to suffering from disease and early death. I mean, the more morbid things. But if you look at the impact that not being included, being an outcast, being perceived as the black sheep, those factors have tremendous social and psychological impact on people. Perhaps that's where that fear came from. There is a, a wonderful anecdote, and I think you said it to me, uh, up, I think it's Seinfeld, Jerry uh, Seinfeld, about people would rather be in the coffin than deliver the eulogy, right? Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's an extreme. That is an extreme. But people do fear, and I've coached people who are doing eulogies or are doing wedding toasts or are doing graduation speeches or anniversary celebration speeches. To them, that is a big deal because they are being put in a spot where they could be ridiculed, where it's people who who mean a lot to to the speaker. And so there's there's high risk even in this what you would consider benign, non-business, right, social ceremonial setting. Yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to speaking in public it doesn't matter if you are in a close group of friends like you would be when you're doing a, a wedding toast right and that supposedly that's a safe environment for you everyone knows you they like you i think but still um perhaps that fear of rejection is even greater when it comes to the people that you love and you don't want to be judged by them so how do we overcome this fear of public speaking? That is a wonderful question with a wonderfully long answer. I have a short version of it. The most important thing, and I teach this to people who have that predicament of sweaty palms, butterflies in the stomach, legs wobbling, perspiration, all the typical signs of someone who is suffering from performance anxiety. What I tell them is to think about service, bringing a service to the people you are addressing, that you're giving them a gift, that you are giving them something that will make them better. So turning nervous into service is the way I like to position it. So it flips the equation. So you are at the service of your audience. They are not there to judge you, to praise you, to ridicule you, to laugh at you, to make funny faces at you. They're there to receive information, insights, knowledge that will make them better. And so you're giving them a service. And if you understand that it's not about you, you're not an actor reading the lines that someone else wrote for you. You're not performing in a formal sense. You are being you, giving ideas that will illuminate people, people's thinking. And so that's a gift. So if you look at it as you're, you're taking your nervousness and turning it into service, that does provide some comfort. Now, Alyssa, it's impossible for someone to say, well, I'm going to stop the butterflies in my stomach. I'm going to stop my hands from shaking. Sometimes you can't really make that go away. It's physical, it's visceral, but make it work for you. Maybe you clutch your notebook or clutch the microphone a little tighter. You use that energy to boost you up, almost like having a shot of very black coffee before you start to speak. So that can serve as an energy boost and don't spend your energy trying to quell it. Use it to your benefit. Yeah, I've heard this before, that feeling nervous and feeling excited 
kind of manifest the same in your body. So in instead of telling yourself, oh, I'm nervous, I don't know how I'm going to do, you can tell yourself, I'm excited and that's why I'm feeling all these things. But the mindset and the perspective completely changes, right? Yes. There are some performers who are headliners and they speak honestly about their stage fright and they never really overcome it. They keep it quiet. You know, they may not be able to keep their lunch down before they go on stage, but they understand that that's part of how they cope. And that's, that's just a fact of life. And it's, there's people who have rituals such as uh, meditation, thinking. Another technique that I find works well is to envision a moment of great bliss when you were married or when you graduated, when you had your first child, when you saw the ocean for the first time, moments of extreme happiness. If you visualize those and have them very clearly pictured in your mind and bring that to the stage, you're already entering from a place of, of, of happiness. You, you, you've changed your mindset. I like that. And, um, I guess it's safe to say, at least that was my case anyway, the more you do it, the more relaxed mm -hmm. you become because it's something that becomes a part of what you do as a business owner or as an employee who has to deliver speeches or to do public speaking all the time. And it does get easier. So I guess that's the good news. Yes. But let me add to that, Alyssa, something that I have learned from professional public speakers now that I left corporate public relations and am now part of the speaker and speaker coach community is speak as often as you just said, and anywhere that you're invited. That would mean speaking to the parent teacher meeting, speaking to a classroom of fifth graders on career day, speaking at a city council or a community board meeting, anywhere, anywhere that you can paid or non-paid speak as often and to, to as many people as you can. And that is practicing the muscle of speaking. And that's very good advice, which I really want to share with the listeners that it's don't save it for formal occasions, speak your message or, or speak your mind wherever and anywhere. And it's always wonderful to tell your story particularly if you're talking to, uh, to children or to adolescents or, uh, or to people who are in career transition. Uh, it is always inspiring to hear from someone's journey. Absolutely. And that is very good advice. You don't want to be speaking for the first time in front of an audience that maybe is your ideal audience and for you to be so nervous because you haven't done this before and not mess it up because I know you are of the, um, of the opinion that there are no mistakes, but it can be a bit more difficult if you're doing it for the very first time in front of the audience that is your ideal audience. We know that most of the people who are listening to this podcast are coaches. And as part of building your coaching business, it's inevitable that at some point, if you want more visibility, you will have to deliver some sort of speech, whether that is a formal one, like I don't know, a TEDx talk or simply mm -hmm. go and network with someone and talk to them, right? <laughs> if we were to think about a coach who is delivering a speech or a presentation for the very first time, what are the essential elements that they would need to be aware of before they deliver that speech? The advice I have is to not sell, to, to be mm -hmm. an individual, to tell your personal story. And I happen to be a coach. I've observed that people will hire you more because they like you because of who you are as a whole person than because you have a CSP and an MS and all the other initials after your name. Important. Those are important achievements. However, when it comes time to develop a bond with a coach and say, okay, I'm going to invest my time, energy, and money in you to help me improve. It's really, it's really the individual that matters. So I would say, tell stories that are true to who you are, not necessarily that speak to your resume as a coach, 
to all the unique things that you bring and the specialties and the domain areas that you manage. You can maybe pepper that a little bit into your, into your talk, but I think that if you speak from the heart and tell people who you are, what your values are, what you stand for, that that is the best place to start. I agree with that as well. It's mostly people need to first buy into you before they buy your services. And for that to happen, they don't want to see you as a salesperson. They want to see the, the real you, not the professional, but the actual person. And if they can relate to you on a personal level, then you can move the discussion further. I wanted to add to that, that however, you want to model best mechanical skills you yep. want to use your voice toolbox properly. You want to use body language properly. You want to use stagecraft and such. So you want to have certain standards that go with professional speaking, but the content, your story, that's something that should be coming from a different place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, since you mentioned body language, tell us a bit more about that. How can we make intentional use of our body language? to help our speech go from good to great. I know a lot of people don't know what to do with their hands. They don't know where to look. Uh, it's, right. a, it's an issue, right? What I say is your hands should be almost like highlighters or like if you had a little emoji crawling under your image, what would that be? And so think about it, it illustrates. So if I wanted to be very firm, Alisa, in saying that, that public speaking can change your life. I'm going to use something like this, which is a box technique, which is like a bracket. Imagine that there's two brackets as you would have on your keyboard. So I'm bracketing this, but I'm also moving forward towards the lens of the webcam to emphasize that I really think this is important. Similarly, using your fists, right? Using, uh, there's also uh, one that I, I love, which is enumerating. So if I have you know, three ideas, three tips for you today, I'm going to use my three fingers and I'm going to go number one, number two, and number three. It is a visual anchor also to help you follow what I'm saying and to keep the attention. So there's many, many ways that you can use your hands, even in a small space, to help your message carry and be remembered. Thank you.